longtime NFL executive of the Eagles and the Cleveland Browns and the co-founder of the 33rd team website, Joe Banner, here in person. Good to see you, Joe. It's great to be here. That was a mouthful. I'm you impressed. know what? I, 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 <laughs> I talk mouthfuls for a living. <laughs> That's what I do for a living. So um, we're, we're getting to the nitty and the gritty portion of team building, are we not? right now we're right on the edge we're right on the edge it's one uh one week ago yesterday is when the negotiation window opens up what do you think of that term joe banner <laughs> negotiating window what do you think of that I think one? whoever got it came up with that is pretty clever don't you think it's better than cheating right well <laughs> don't you think well we, we negotiation period no, is that what it is negotiation, negotiation period, period. We used to call it tampering period, and we heard right. that back. Uh, you know, hey, maybe you want to choose a different word. Um, so when when uh, Aaron Rodgers shows up in New York to talk to the Jets, clearly that means the Packers are given permission. Absolutely. Right? What Can't do you do read? That. What do you read from that? Well, I think it's hard to imagine he's going back to Green Bay after he goes and takes a visit with another team, and we don't know. It could be the first of a series of visits, but right. I, I can't picture a scenario where the team gives a quarterback. That stature at this point in his career, permission to go talk to another team, and he's coming back to them. Right. It's tough to put that genie back in the bottle, right? No. I mean, even with darkness for four days and whether else you got to do, I don't know how you get to the place where you go, okay, right. I'm going back there. I mean, you know, he, he's at least earned wanting to be wanted, right? Right. <laughs> exactly. So, so the fact that he's gone there means he's essentially gone, don't you think? I think it would be shocking if you ended up back in Green Bay after this. I mean, two days ago you asked me, I would have said, who knows? Right. You know, but now that you hear he has shown up in New York and he is having direct conversations with the Jets, which must have been blessed by Green Bay. I mean, you know, actions speak loud on the words. At least one of them said, I don't want to be back here, or at least I want to look into what my options are. And, you know, in the conversation of the best quarterbacks ever to play the game, now you bring him back after you say that to him. Right. Or he said to you, you know, I'd, I'd like to see what else is available. Mm -hmm. I I can't picture what conversation fixes that. And then we line up, training camp, everything's good. Let's pretend that didn't happen. So then what's your best guess of what the conversation is between Rodgers and the Jets? Well, I assume the Jets are just in a recruiting mode. And I assume they've at least had some preliminary conversation with the Packers. I mean, it's just too visible a thing. It's not going to go unnoticed. Right. And, it, you know, they got players on their team that are going to be affected, you know, mentally, psychologically by what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. So I assume they've at least had preliminary conversation enough to know that if they want to get a deal done, they're at least in the same ballpark. They may still have to finish the details. And they're in recruiting mode. You know, they're trying to show him that, uh, you know, if you want to finish your career and have another chance at a Super Bowl, you can do it here. I mean, that's to me, it's a tough, tough sell. I know those are your guys, but no, I, that's I a tough it. sell. Well, what, what 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 makes you think it's a tough sell? And I'm, well, I, I just, you know, listen, I'm very basic about this. I don't think you win a Super Bowl. They're a great quarterback in two dominant lines. Everything else, that's not the end of the story, but you got to start there. And I just don't see the Jets, even with the Rodgers, at the point where they're going to be able to, you know, dominate those lines the way teams. you got to be able to prevent pressure on your quarterback, be able to get pressure on the other quarterback. If you look at the end of the Super Bowl, the teams that win it almost every year, you can say those things. They were really good at protecting their quarterback. They were really good at pressuring the quarterback. And, and, to me, and have a pretty darn good quarterback of their own. That's right. Those are the three things. Now, again, you don't win the Super Bowl if you have those three things. But that's the foundation for me. Right. So if I'm Aaron Rodgers, I think I'm playing two more years. I'm not, you know, I may be betting if I don't have any other options, but I'm not betting if I do have other options that that's the – that that team is in that position where they can dominate those areas that I think are crucial. And I don't think he cares about anything but winning a Super Bowl. Sure. So if he agrees that those are the priorities, you know, I think it would be tough to get there in the next two years with the Jets. Right. And so uh, that aside, because he may not have another option, right. certainly if we've established that you don't believe Joe Banner, the option of staying put once he's kicking tires, going somewhere else, and the Packers say, go for it, you check it out. That you can you can put the genie back in the bottle. I mean, anything's possible. Yeah, right. We've seen surprising things, but I mean, I just think about it. And you know, listen, he's he's, you know, a guy that has a lot of emotions. He has a lot of opinions. I don't say that you know critically. Right. You know, most successful people do, quite frankly. Yes. But you know, the emotion that comes with that after all these years, after the, what they went through last year, did the contract. I can't even picture how you start the conversation. You know, after the second thought, we'd actually like to have you come back. I mean, you had a whole year to think about this and well, figure it out. Well, he'd say on second thought, I'd like to come back. Yeah, that listen, if he's if he gets to an, another place or places, yes, and he doesn't feel they can win, and there's only options. But I think there's truth, and I know you said it, but others have too. I think there's some truth to the Packers kind of feeling like you know it, it's time to 
get to the next phase of what the Green Bay Packers are going to be. When I also said this too, Joe, is that, you know, um, Rogers saying, you know, he wanted out may, may not have anything to do with anything other than he looks around the locker room and he doesn't know any of these kids anymore mm-hmm. anyway, or, and he's aged out, if you will, and the Packers will be like, it's time we, we drafted this kid and now these kids have to grow together. And he may feel that sense. And other than Bakhtiari and, and Randall Cobb, there may not be anybody on that roster who he feels, you know, that tight with, close with. It's not the same way. It's not as fun. He doesn't want to be around as much anymore. So let's try something new. Let's try something else. Totally understand that. And if he does look at the Jets and he does see that there's weapons around and he does have the offensive coordinator he likes and he does have the city life that he probably would want to give a kick of a tire to, I get it. So what happens then? What do you think is your your best guess, Joe Banner, former NFL executive, the conversation, the horse trading between Brian Gutekunst, GM of the Packers, and Joe Douglas, GM of the Jets is? What do you think that looks yeah, like? Yeah, listen, I think they're – the Packers are going to be thinking huge. And, you know, go back to with the Brett Farr experiment mm-hmm. that you had at, at the Jets. But I think the Packers are going to think that they should be able to get in quite a bit for the quarterback. I mean, he still played really well last year. I'm not saying he played as well as he did, you know, five years ago, or he's that same guy, but he does put you on the map as a Super Bowl contender. So if 13th, you sign him. So they'll ask for the 13th it, overall pick yes, as a starter? Yes, and go from there. Yeah, that's what they'll ask for. I oh. think they'll ask for a couple of ones. What do they got to lose? And then they'll back off from there. <laughs> you, you, you know, because w- would you accept that if you were Joe Douglas? Let's put you in the shoes you see, of Joe here's Douglas. Because the I mean, there's a $60 million contract yeah, apparently as I saw well. you guys talking about this with Andrew Brandt. That there's what should happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then there's what happens. And a lot of it is driven. And you mentioned this. Are you going to risk your job for the difference between paying somebody 35 and 45 you're going to risk your job because it's the 13th pick versus it's two twos. And, you know, the Jets guys are getting to the point where somebody's going to have higher expectations of what they should be achieving. They've been in place long enough. We see, you know, go back to the bills when they turned it around, go back to Andy when he going to Kansas City. By the end of three years, you should have a very good team. That's my view of it. Mm-hmm. Year one, maybe you have to take a step back, which year two used to be starting to move forward. By year three, we sh- should be obvious to everybody. It shouldn't be a, the owner sitting there going, I'm not sure. Well, you know, Joe Douglas, Robert Seller are kind of at the point now where you're really starting to legitimately have some high expectations. And if they can't deliver them, they're going to find themselves in the hot seat conversation. So do you overpay for a Rogers and you feel maybe not confident in what you have anymore? Sure you do. You're giving away picks that the next guy would have used if you didn't use them to get the right players to at least convince the owner he deserves some more time. And then that comes into every one of these decisions. So we can talk about these quarterbacks, why, for the most part, we just saw it, but we generally haven't seen a middle marketplace. Because, you know, Aikman left it took the Cowboys 10 years to find the right next guy. I mean, we lost McNabb when I was in Philadelphia. We tried to kind of pass the torch to Vic mm-hmm. because we'd seen this happen so many times. So if you don't anticipate, we drafted Cobb in the second round, all with the hope that we weren't going to be the team that took five or 10 years to find the next quarterback to the last one. Because if you're that guy, you're probably not there by the time you find that quarterback unless you're lucky enough to hit on the first try and not have a top five pick. That's that's why the Eagles went out and got Wentz a few years ago. Mm-hmm. They were like, you know, traded a massive amount to get up to get Wentz. And we were all sitting there going, you know, he looks really good, but he didn't play at a top-notch school and he didn't play that much and he even got hurt a little bit in college. Wow, this is a big gamble. But you recover from it. But you got to have a situation where you trust that the owner really, really believes in you. So, like, un- so unless, by the way, the straight talk from Joe Banner here. So, so unless, basically, what you're saying that Gutekunst asks for the moon and won't back off, and refuses to toss in a lot, any money, hardly any money, the Jets and Gutekunst will come to some sort of an agreement because this is the best option for Joe Douglas to try and win playoff games right here, right now, and at his part of his tenure of his stay with the Jets. Yeah, I mean, I think the difference is, I mean, I'm not sitting here thinking he can sign Garoppolo instead, and he's got a real good chance to go a long way. So somebody else may look at, you know, the Baker may feel like Garoppolo and feel like if they were in the right situation, maybe. I don't see that. I see Rodgers as the only chance that really has a chance to dramatically elevate the team. I think it's at the point in time where he needs to do that. Now, a lot of things have to fall in place. The Packers have to be willing. Yes. You know, and there is a point where he's just going to say, okay, it's too much. 
you know, I've got the guy for a couple of years, it's just too much. But you can sense when a team is at the point where they're getting anxious. And I feel like it feels that way with the Jets. They feel good about what they've done so far. They feel like they're on the right track. But it's time to take a bigger step forward than the steps they've been taking so far. So for me, it's kind of a natural spot that the team and the player, where they're at, you know, could match up. Joe Banner here, former NFL executive, co-founder of the 33rd Team website right here on the Rich Eisen Show. Uh, what is happening in your best of your ability between Lamar Jackson and the Ravens and the conundrum that that they seem to be in once again as franchise tag day has arrived? You know, it's I, I've been really defending Lamar for the last couple of years when people were criticized as an agent, all this kind of stuff. I thought he was making the right move. Take your time. The market's going to go up. You know, you're not going anywhere. And I couldn't imagine a scenario in the end. I mean, he was saying, I want to finish my career in Baltimore. The Ravens were saying, oh, we'll get this done. It's just a question of when. And here we sit. And, you know, we all think it's because of the guaranteed money. And I think we're probably right about that. But, you know, we never really know what's going on inside those negotiations. I just think that Lamar has uh, viewed himself as um, somebody who's standing up for the collective good of the players and the opportunity to potentially leverage the Watson contract and getting himself a fully guaranteed contract. And what that could mean as we go down the road, I think he's taken that on as a cause. So I don't think it's just his contract anymore. I think that uh, he's seeing a much greater importance, a much greater opportunity. Now, here's the, the reality, despite what you hear is, if you're 25 years old, and you're a top tier player, the chances that you're gonna collect 100% of your contract are extraordinarily high. So if he's fighting, if he, if he has an offer in front of him, the average is fair, the length is something he can live with, mm -hmm. and he's fighting to get more of it guaranteed, he's fighting for something that has almost no chance of mattering. I know we're always saying, like we're judging contracts, the guy gets the most guaranteed money actually got the best deal. Yes, It's not always true. If you're 25, so I'm a very narrow category I'm talking about, and you're a top-tier player at your position, you sign a three, four, five-year deal, the odds are extremely high, whether 10% of that contract is guaranteed or 75%, that you're going to get all the money in that contract. So there is a risk. I'm not saying it's 100%. But if he's in a place where he's happy, he's had coaches, I think, that have done a really good job to use what he does well. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I do think they have some wide receivers in there now. They, Bateman got hurt last year. I mean, I thought he looked really good, but for a long time didn't have the weapons that he needed to really thrive all the time in the passing game. I, if I were him, I would try to find, find a way to get the deal done. Now, that's assuming that the length and the average are okay because, you know, these guarantees, we'll, we're going to watch all of these quarterbacks in the mid-20s who signed these new deals in the mid-20s, and they're all going to collect all the money in the contract. So he's fighting for something that I think is of minimal value. And he could end up switched, having to go to a place that he won't be happy, that can't take advantage of what he does as well. I worked with John Harbaugh for 12 years. Mm -hmm. I can say he's not going to find a, co a coach any better to play for than John Harbaugh. So I think he's in a really good situation, and he should make sure if he's fighting for something, it really is going to matter. So, uh, I, and by the way, um, for the stuff that you hear, and I kind of trafficked in that world Yesterday, when I came up with a whole bunch of rumors and actually said them and spilled some tea that I heard at the combine from a bunch of people, that the the Ravens' support of Lamar publicly is through the roof, yeah. and you know, not even relationships that you th sense aren't perfect that wind up being more imperfect. You, th there's usually just the tip of the iceberg. They haven't given any hint of that at all publicly. They have not done nothing but throw their arms around him and love him and support him in that in that respect. But I'm trying to pick up what you're putting down here. Do you think, Joe Banner, if Lamar had an agent, he'd have settled by now? I do, Th just because everybody else in his shoes did. But I'm not sure that was right. As I said, I've been, I've been applauding the fact that, I mean, if you're a quarterback and you're a star player, the longer you wait, the more money you're going to get. Now right. you're taking some injury risk. Yes, but we were in an era where the medical advances have been so great that we hardly ever see a player whose career ends. So Lamar Jackson's not going to suddenly go out and have a career-ending injury. Could he have enough injuries that people start to worry about his durability? We may be on the precipice of that right now. That can certainly happen. But the injury risk that players take when they wait now is so much smaller than it was a decade ago. And most of it's because they prepare better and because the medicine is such a, you know, we used to worry about guys coming back from ACLs. Then we had a period where, oh, well, He'll come back from an ACL, but not till year two. Right. Now we watch guys get back out on the field and they look like nothing ever happened. So I, you know, I don't think he should 
rush to do a deal out of fear of getting, getting hurt. And I've been saying that for two years. And I think if he had an agent, look, all the agents that have represented these players are doing these deals after three years. Because it's hard to walk away from one hundred and fifty plus million dollars. But they're also money. not they're also not getting the Deshaun Watson deal either. No, no. And so and my point is, you'd rather get that. But if the choice is to have to leave a team that believes in you with a coaching staff that you have a good rapport with on a team they have a good chance to win, what you're fighting for is probably not going to matter. What do you think of that, Chris? What do you think of that, TJ? I mean, this is pretty much uh, straight talk right there and it. what's right in front. So what is – what is? Um, walk me through before we uh, we put a pin in this part of our conversation, Joe Banner. What's Eric DaCosta's choice between how to franchise tag him that's coming between now and 4 p.m. Eastern time yep. that we're assuming that's going to happen, that <laughs> this Rubik's Cube on what contract he's – willing to accept and the Ravens are willing to offer is not going to get solved between four, but now and four Eastern time. Yeah. I mean, he's, he'll, he'll get tagged even if it's for the purpose of trading him. They're not going to just do nothing. Uh, they may be using the deadline, you know, to see if there's any way to scramble. I mean, listen, at some point the Ravens must not be believing a hundred percent that he's either taken a fully guaranteed deal or not. There's like, there's no in between ground. Mm -hmm. Obviously it's a negotiation. You never really know till the end. What was the other side really willing to do versus yes. what were they saying they were willing to do? They're always two different things, even though sometimes they're close. So I, and the cost is, if he feels like he has a chance to get a deal done, it's a good window to scramble in and go, listen, let's, let's take one last shot at this thing and try to do it. But if they're really set on the fact that they're not giving a guaranteed deal, then they could tag him two ways. One gives another, other teams an opportunity to talk to him. Yes. If they get a deal done, then the Ravens get two, two ones back this year and next year is one. Uh, the other draft pick doesn't allow anybody to, to talk to him even. He's theirs for a year. It's pay a lot more so money. I think it's about $15 million difference. So what would you... Well, I, listen, if I, it, it, you'd have to really know what's going on. I'm, we're yes. guessing a little about what's yeah, going yeah. on, in which case I would put the lower tag on him. Me too. I'd, and say, and say, hey, you go... It, don't take our word for it. You go. Right. And also knowing, you know, if you want to play some four or five-dimensional chess, that one of the spots he might really want to go to and talk to is Miami. And they don't have a first round selection right. this year, so they would be ineligible yep. for signing Lamar because they don't have a one this year. Yep. Now, obviously, they can go ahead and make a trade to get one, just to hand to the Ravens and say we have it for you. But to me, that would be that would be the way to go. You know, yeah. but well, you're the expert. I'm well, I don't think there's any choice because now you're in a negotiation, so you're looking for a little bit of leverage. So if he's tacked to pay for $32 million a year, he's more motivated to get something done. Now, something done may be with somebody else. Remember, they can't trade without him agreeing to it because he has to sign the tag before they can trade him. Yes. So people need to remember that. He will have a certain amount of control even once he's tagged as to what happens next year. Now, we all wondered at the end of the last season, was he hurt that bad that he had a miss, whatever, ended up being seven or eight games? Because remember, when he went out, we thought he was going to be back in three or four weeks. Yes. Or did the contract play some part in that? We can speculate forever. We'll probably never know. But if, in fact, you're even worried about that and you're at the team and you tag him, yeah. knowing that he has no problem not playing and collecting the money, what are you going to do now? He's already demonstrated he could just leave you hanging there. You could have him. You could be in a position where you have to pay him and you got nothing for him. Who's your quarterback for this year? And how are you going to get some value for him in the future? So the Ravens are really highly motivated to find a way to get something done here relatively soon, in my opinion, because they could really end up where it's just so obvious that they have to do something and that they've got really no options and that he truly is going to stick to his guns. What if he, in just the last one, and then we'll take a break and we'll have, we'll have, I want to ask you about the Eagles and what you think they're going to do moving forward here. What about, you know, Atlanta? I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah. Just throwing just a name out there. And I know they have Desmond Ritter, but do you think Atlanta would cough up two ones? I do. Okay. I do. I would as well. And <laughs> so then you're Baltimore, you're sitting there at eight. You got a shot at somebody to yeah. draft this year if you like them, if you yeah. interviewed them and you like them, right? I mean, don't you think? Well, somebody's going to get from around there. They're going to get one of those guys. Vegas, it's seven. Right. So you go into seven, eight, nine, four. I mean, I'm. I think two of those teams are going to trade up. Or two of those spots, let's just say. Right. We don't know who will have them by then. Two of those spots are going to trade up. I mean, I personally think there's two studs in the draft. 
and a couple of other guys that have a good chance. We'll see. But they're more question marks. But, but I think you can get to two and still get somebody. That's what I'm saying. But, but obviously, Lamar would have to do them the favor of signing at a spot where they could be already in position high enough to draft his replacement. Yeah, and that would have to be your again. There's a lot of dice roll right here. Remember, and the somebody has to be willing to give him a fully guaranteed contract because it does him no good to go through all of this and just go to a different team and not get what he wouldn't take from Baltimore. And apparently, Atlanta wasn't willing to do that all those years ago, which is why Deshaun Watson wound up in exactly Cleveland. I look at the list. I'm not sure who on that list I point to and say that owner would give somebody a fully guaranteed contract for over 200 million dollars. I'm not sure. Who There's that not is. another one in the league, right? <laughs> it looks. It's very hard to even predict anybody that you think would do that. Joe Banner, long-time executive, front office executive in this league uh, that we love in the NFL and uh, the co-founder of the 33rd team. Check out uh, many of his musings and players and coaches from uh, back in the day uh, writing there. So let's jump into what the Bears' decision is first overall. You never had – you had – did you ever have the number one overall two. pick? We had we took McNabb with two. That was the highest. That was got. the highest you got. Thankfully, <laughs> that, yeah. Thankfully, that's as high as you got. Or thankfully that you had a chance well, to get McNabb. Both, right? <laughs> but I was thinking, thankfully, we never had the first. What did you pick. think of when he got booed? Joe? Oh, it was terrible. Because he wasn't Ricky Williams. Right. It's, it's like you didn't have any any thought of taking Ricky Williams. No, back listen. In the the day, irony is, had we taken a running back, we had Edgar and James with a higher grade. But it was never even a consideration to take mm-hmm. a running back. But if we had, that would have really shocked the You would have taken Edron James. Yeah. Well, I think everybody did. Didn't they? The Colts kind of surprised everybody by taking. Right. And we would we had it the same way on our board if we were picking a running back. But no, we were lucky to get Donovan. A really good guy. Was, played really well. So did, when did you? Did, all right. So what was your chat with him after he got booed? What did you and Andy say to him? Yeah, no, I mean, we, we wanted him to know that, you know, now he was one of us. We had his back and all that. At the same mm-hmm. time, we didn't want to make it a bigger deal. Donovan's mindset at the time, and who knows what he's really feeling, was, mm-hmm. I'm okay. Don't worry about it. I can handle this. I'm okay. Right. But, you know, you, you dream of that moment your whole life. And then it happens, and it's got all this negative stuff around it. Right. And, you know, he, Donovan's a strong-minded guy. He's a self-confident guy. But I can't imagine, you know, I actually went to a dinner once and got booed. And it's a terrible feeling. You were, what do you mean you went to a dinner? Yeah, was the, the, the uh, Maxwell Club, okay. which I was actually on the board at, and mm-hmm. they introduced the uh, people sitting on the dais one at a time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it was very early when Jeff and I were there. We hadn't produced very much yet. Yeah. And so they introduced you. You got to literally walk through the crowd to get mm-hmm. to the, the front stage, and I got booed. You got booed Come because you because the team hadn't? Produced enough just yeah, yet? Yeah, well, we're in Philadelphia now. You know, no, no, hey, I get it. I was at the Super Bowl this year, and, you know, Eagles fans are in the stadium, and they introduced the Hall of Famers, the new Hall of Fame uh-huh. class. Don- and DeMarcus Ware, they didn't do him any favors by putting him on the board as a Bronco. They put him on the board as a Cowboy. <laughs> Boo. Dak Prescott, Walter Payton, man in the air. <laughs> Boo. It was – but I, 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 I respect it in, in, no, in a way, I, too. I t- you know, like it's just – that's it. I did not say that as a complaint. It I was, hear you. It was a great place to work. The people cared. I mean, it's so much fun when you're going well and they're so on board and yeah. it, just the energy and excitement. So I would, I wouldn't want to work in one of the cities that was you know more passive about the team. But it comes with good and bad. Sure, no <laughs> doubt about it. So uh, and I, I do want to talk about the Eagles' current state and future plans and with you in a second. But what do you think the the uh, Bears are going? I, are going to do with the first overall pick and their options. Listen, I think, think they're going to trade that pick. I personally wouldn't. I just think the top two quarterbacks in this draft are so good, and I worry about fields. And it just, you know, it changes everything for a decade or more. Um, but listen, those are opinions that could easily be wrong. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're watching a game in which quarterbacks running are having impacts that, you know, we necess- didn't necessarily predict even five years ago. So, you know, there are ways they can use fields that I think can be very effective. And the top two in your mind are Bryce Young and C.J. Stroud? Stroud, yeah. I mean, so if you're the Bears, you'd take one, one of those two? I, I would. You know, I, I listen, I just, this is how I think about it. If you hit on the first round, it's 50%. Mm-hmm. That's the hit rate in the first round. The hit rate in the second round is 40%. Mm-hmm. So let's just say you got two ones and two twos. You're probably getting two players, two quality starters. Mm-hmm. 
but I trade the difference between, let's say, a B quarterback and an A quarterback, or I have two other players at different positions. I mean, for me, that's a no-brainer. The quarterback can make such a massive difference that I'm taking the difference between you know a good and a really good quarterback. And remember, they're both really projection at this point. We know a little bit more about fields. We've at least sure. seen them on the field with other NFL players. The other guys we haven't. Right. Um, and I'm not sure in the end I wouldn't pick Stroud even first if I had the first pick. Some of it just watching, you know, all the Murrays, all the Hurts, all the, all these guys are getting hurt. Mm-hmm. You know, so maybe we shouldn't be blowing through size actually matters as quickly as we have as, you know, we go to Kyla Murray as the first pick in the draft. So, you know, if you gave me a chance to have a guy that I really believe is a chance to be a top five difference maker, can carry a team versus be on a very good team, uh, I'm willing to make that trade. So I want to get the best quarterback I possibly can within reason. So if we if we then assume that uh, Poles is going to trade it, that they do yeah. seemingly love Fields clearly more than you know what you have professed, and they yep. are also the ones in the building with him. There, yep. so let's just say that's what's going to happen. What's Poles' first order of business? We're continuing to do the. How does one operate when you're trading a first overall pick? So his phone is probably ringing. Hopefully, it's not the other way because it does give away a little bit of strength if you're the one initiating the call. But you know, you can always cover that up. I always say the leverage in the negotiations is a perception of leverage as opposed to anything you actually have. So no one knows how many other teams are talking to him or what spots in the draft they're at. So it's easy to recreate the leverage even if he gets in the position where he has to initiate the calls. Mm-hmm. But he's looked at what Wentz got. He looked at what Goff got. He's gone through all those trades, and he's like, why shouldn't I get at least that? And I think he's right. I think there's enough teams in the top ten that want a quarterback. There are really high quarterbacks at the top of the draft, and I think he's going to get – when he makes the trade as much as we've seen anybody get. So I think once three ones and a couple of twos, I think it's going to be a blockbuster trade as big as anything we've ever seen. Really? Okay. When do you think that happens? Well, you know, if I were trying to do it, I would want to do it before free agency started because otherwise how can I plan what to do? So I wouldn't be shocked if it happens here in the next week or so. If it doesn't happen in the next week or so, I think it's probably not likely to happen until within a week or two of the draft. Mm-hmm. I think there's two windows. We're in one now. If it passes, then there's kind of a lull in the middle. And then as we get close to the draft, it, get, it heats up again. And uh, before I let you go uh, onto your day, uh, what do you think is in front of Howie Roseman right now? Yeah, I uh, actually think this is the most interesting contract of all the ones we're out there. In Jalen Hurts. Room. Yeah. Okay. I mean, they, they and you're they, by the way, Burrow's in line, yep. and Herbert's in line, yep. and I'm sure, you know, there'll be a, all eyes to see how much guaranteed from them. What do, what do you think? And this is this is why to me this is really interesting. I mean, the players should be fighting really hard for a short deal. All three of these guys, by yes. the way. Mm-hmm. And if I'm fee- if I'm uh, uh, hurts, I'm actually sitting back going to the Caribbean, let those other guys get their deals done, and then I'm coming in. Mm-hmm. And I'm hoping they did three or four-year deals, and I'm hoping they've pushed the $50 million mark up into the 50 to $55 million range. Mm-hmm. And I don't see any way you can walk into the Eagles' offices and say, you know, I want the, what they got. I've accomplished a comparable amount. And how do they say no? Now, the Eagles are going to fight for a long-term deal. I mean, they're still employing many of the philosophies I did when I was there. The longer the deal, the better it is for the team. I mean, if he does a three-year deal, they own his rights for four more years. The capital have gone up $100 million between now and then. I mean, that's almost 50%. Mm-hmm. So a guy making $50 million now is going to be a 75 to $80 million per year player in five years. So the Eagles are going to, the, every extra year they get is going to save them a massive amount of money, even if they give him a great deal right now. The highest paid guy right now is 50. Let's say they gave him 53, 54, 55, which would be a big jump at that level yes. from where we are right now. But let's say they get five years instead of four. That fifth year should be at 80 million bucks. Instead, it's going to be part of an average of 50. So they're saving $30 million probably mm-hmm. for every extra year they get on that contract. By the way, the same will be true for Barrow and Herbert on all those guys. See, if I was an agent right now, we're presenting those guys, I wouldn't be fighting for the guarantee. I'm going to get a huge guarantee no matter what. Mm-hmm. I'm taking that huge guarantee, but I'm fighting like hell for a short deal. It's not going to take long for you to be sitting there with somebody like Hertz, who maybe has gone to two Super Bowls by the time he's been in the league three or four years from now. 
So you think Mahomes is the last 10-year deal that we're going to see? I don't think we'll ever see that again. People forget Holmes did something, Mahomes did something, and I didn't even think at the time it was a terrible idea or it's turned out to be a terrible idea, and many people saw it at the time. His contract is really effectively fully guaranteed for 10 years. And at the time, he jumped the market by almost 20%. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, okay, he jumped the market. It's going to take two, three, four years for the market to even catch up to where he is. And he's effectively got a 10-year fully guaranteed contract. He's going to make 500 million bucks. But what happened was the next deal worked off of his deal. So instead of it taking three or four years to catch the market up to the jump that he created, it took like one. Right. So by the time we get to the third or fourth year of his deal, it's a horrible deal. Unless he's getting $500 million to play in a place that he loves for a coach that he loves in a situation where yeah. they, they're, they're in it every year. And so flipping away back to what you said about Lamar, sometimes you take what you take when you're in a spot that you love with a coach that you love and a spot where you can win. Right? right. Here's the question, though, for me is I think you could have had all of those things and done a five-year deal and then done another five-year deal. I mean, it wasn't like the Chiefs were going to fall out of love with him. Right. And then he could have just protected himself against. Now, when he did his deal, it wasn't as obvious as now the cap was going to go up this much. We thought the cap was going to go up more. we got teams opening in places like LA. We have new TV market deals coming along. But he jumped the market by 20%. So at least for a while, maybe he's kind of ahead of the game. And then the guarantees kind of cover maybe the shortfall of the last few years. But the market has blown past him so fast, it's just a terrible deal. So what else does Howie need to secure? What do you think? What else is on his plate here? Well, I listen, how many, you know, he believes what I stated earlier, and that's where he's going to start. He's going to try to lock down the quarterback, and he's going to try to solidify both of his lines. And he's going to go from there. And they're really in pretty good shape if you do those two things. They're going to have some, you know, slays turning older. You know, Bradbury is about to become a free agent. So they have some work to do, especially in the secondary. Right. But they've now won two Super Bowls. With what I think is just a pretty good. Well, they made two Super Bowls. Well, you know, sorry. I know what you're, you might have wished Slipping. for, but now right. you're here. Right, right. But they did it with a secondary that most teams would not be playing in a Super Bowl with. Right. Because of the dominant defensive line, which is, you know. Which Howie hit twice during the season as well with Joseph and Sue. He hit it on, he, yeah. he kept hitting it again and again the good thing during with, the season. The good too. thing with the Eagles and Howie is you don't really have to work very hard to predict what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, their their philosophy is very, very evident, both how they play the game itself yes. and how they build the team. So it's one of the easier teams in to predict what they're going to do. He's going to acquire more additional defensive and offensive linemen until he feels like he's not only got dominant lines, yes. but he's got some depth in case something happened. Then he's going to go and do whatever's next. He needs a running back, but he'll get that in the middle of the draft and he'll be fine with it. And he even likes the guy that they got. And they got to work on the secondary and the defense. They're going to lose a lot of players, but they're much closer to staying at the top than people realize, especially they, if Hurts plays. And like they clearly did. hit on the coach. They hit on the coach. Who'd have thunk? <laughs> I gave him incredible credit. It takes a lot. Because if you have a long coaching search, yes. no matter how good it is, you're getting ripped. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it works. Mm -hmm. As it goes on, it appears to be... You know, like you were ill-prepared. Yes. Like it's taking too long. Like people must be rejecting you. All that stuff starts to get speculated. So you've just got to really believe in yourself and just trust like none of this matters as long as in the end we win. So they went through a process there where they were just taking incredible heat. And from the outside, it did look like, but the reality is they were just like, we know what we're looking for. We haven't seen it yet. And then We're going to keep looking. And then his first press conference said, <laughs> yeah. which he even used this year by showing it to his team, Sirianni used himself in his first press conference to show everybody how you can improve. Yep. I, 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 I've, I've just loved everything that he's done yep. from start, start to present, man. And, they, and both his assistants get, get rated. How about so. when they turned to the ref and told him, I know what I'm doing when he ran down the sideline? You remember that, tape? <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. He knows only one speed. Hey, Joe, thanks for letting me know you're in town. No, Greatly my appreciate it. Everybody Great being with you. Right here. Uh, check out uh, Joe Banner on Twitter at jbanner13, right? Yeah. Is that what it is? Very good. And also, um, uh, the 33rd team as well. Check that out. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern, for free.